So welcome back. Now we're going to build up and talk about some slightly more complex conditional execution patterns that you can build up. So as you do the if then else, again, one of the things to do is to visualize the blocks, start thinking of the blocks. And in this case, you think of the block as sort of starting at the if and then ending after the, 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 the last indented line. But the if and the else kind of are piece of one thing and you can sort of think of the, this is the block, right? And one of the things about these blocks is they have one entrance and one exit. Not that that's a big deal, but it's a good way to think about how you mentally start drawing the blocks. You see one entrance and one exit, and there's some complexity. There's some logic that you're sort of building, um, and that's, that's how these blocks work. So the next step up in complexity is a multi-wave if, and that uses a keyword called elif, which is really a combination of else and if. So the way it works is, probably easier to do this on the GPS version of it, is it comes down here, forget what's in here, it asks the yes or no. If it's yes, it runs this one and then it's all done. If it's no and then yes, it runs this one and it's all done. And if it's no, 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 it runs this one and it's done. A key thing is it's only going to do one of these three. It's not going to do two. It's only going to do one. And it, and it checks these questions in order. And then this else is like a catch-all. So let's take a look at how this particular one works. Um, it depends on the value of x. So let's, what if x were 0? Well, if x were 0, it would come in, ask the question, is x less than 2? Yes, it is. So it would run this code, and it would finish down here. So it would come over here, true, run, and now skip all the way down. If you draw a box, the box would be this box right here. It skips out of the box. Or if you draw the box over here, the box would be right here. You, you, once you're done with this line of code, with this block of text right there, or block of code, you exit the block. You don't like come back and look at this question. You have run, one thing is turned true, and you're done. If on the other hand, x was five, you would see a situation where it would come in. This would be false, and so it would skip. Then it comes to this next elif, this becomes true. So then it jumps in and does this code, runs out and is done. Does not run that, does not run that, does run that. So comes in, no, it's not less than two, it is less than 10, so we'll run that little block of code and now we are all done completely. So no, no, but yes, okay? And so that's how it works. These are done in sequence. They're not looked at sort of in parallel or all at the same time. If, on the other hand, x was 20, it would say false, skip, question mark, false, skip, oh, else, then it's the, it's the it else always gets triggered if it gets that far, and then it runs that one. So here we say, if it's less than 2, no, it's not. Is it less than 10? No, it's not. And if it's there, we just hit the else part, and we finish, and we continue on. So this part doesn't run, this part doesn't run, and that part runs. The rule is, one of the three will run and the other two will not. It only triggers once. Once it's triggered, then it's done with the whole if statement. And again, I think of this as the block. And, it, and you'll see in a sec, you can have one. Once one of these things hits true, it runs this and then exits the block completely. So there's other variations on this. You can, if you want, have no else. So there is no need to have an else. What we've done is we've simply de-indented this next line. There's no else here, but that's okay. It does mean that for some value of, of they might not either execute, right? Because there's no else. If there's else, then at least one will execute. But if there is, um, if there's no else, then it could be possible that zero execute. In this case, um, x is five. It's not going to do this one, but it is going to do that one because x is less than ten. But if um, x was, for example, 50, then that would be false, that would be false, and it would just go. And then neither of these two things were, would execute if x were 50. Okay, So it just means that you don't have to have an else if you don't want to. Further, you can have lots of LFs. If x is less than 2, do this. LF, 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 LF. And remember, it checks them in order. First, second, third, fourth, fifth. So if, if x was 15, this would be false, this would be false, this would be true, so it would run this code, and then it would come down whatever's next down here. So, it, so again, 
only one of these is going to trigger. No, no, yes, no, no, no. I mean, 15 is indeed less than 40. If it came here, it would be true, but it doesn't matter because one has triggered. And so then it takes the entire block, and there's our entire block. So as soon as it executes one, the next thing to do is escape or exit right out of the block. Okay? Got it? Okay, so here are a couple of puzzles. I'll give you a second to pause this. And the question is to look at some of these, depending on, for a particular value of x, you will have none of them execute. So which will never happen regard for some particular value of x? Meaning you can pick any value for x you want, but there's some that you can't cause to execute. Okay? So I'll pause for a second, let you, uh, let you pause the video if you want, and then I'll come back and explain it to you. Okay, you had some time to pause. Hopefully you're, you did pause or didn't pause, but it doesn't matter. You can still pause while I'm talking until I start drawing and telling you the answer. Okay, so in this one, if x is less than 2, do this, else if x greater than or equal to 2. The one that's never going to execute is this one right here. And that's because no matter what value of x, it is either less than or equal to 2 or greater than or equal to 2. So for any value of x, no matter what you pick, it's either going to run this one or this one, but it's never going to run that one for any value of x. Okay? So that's a little tricky. I just happen to have constructed my logical questions in such a way that they covered all values of x, and so the else was kind of irrelevant. Now, I wouldn't even draw this this way. If I was going to draw this or write this code, I would probably just like, you know, make this be an else colon and this not be there. But this was more of a puzzle than anything else. So in this next one, we have to remember that these things happen in order. So if x is less than 2, we're going to run this. If it's less than 20, we're going to run this. If it's less than 10, we're going to run this. But the problem is all values of x that are less than 10, are, for which this would become true, this is always true. So a value like 6, this becomes true. So that means that if it's something like 6, it's going to run this and come out and never ask this question, right? So that's the key. Even though this is true and this is true for the six, it never even gets here because this one triggered first, okay? And so that's, that's why this is the line of code that no matter what the value for x, will never run. Okay, so the last conditional code is what's called the try and accept structure. And, uh, you know, it's, if you, if you uh, learn other programming languages, this sort of catching errors is a more advanced concept. But in Python, we tend to have to use it earlier because there are, there are things where if you don't use it, the code blows up. And the whole idea of a try, try accept is that you have a bit of code that you know might fail. And so you kind of want to take out an insurance policy on it and say, hey, give this a try. If it works, great. If it doesn't, do this other thing. Don't blow up. Don't get a trace back. And so this is a way to eliminate or catch a trace back, something that would otherwise be a trace back. That's what this is for. So if you got some line of code and you know that this might blow up and have a trace back, then you use try accept around it. Okay? So let's take a look at something. This is a sample we had from the previous code, and it comes down, it, it sticks hello Bob in, then it converts this to an integer, and we know that if these things are digit, this code blows up. And so it runs, and we get the traceback. It, and it, the traceback happens um, because of this line right here. But the key thing about the traceback is that the traceback, as I told you before, it, it stops. And it stopped at line two, which means this is the last line it executed, but it doesn't continue which means this code is gone. I mean, it, it, it never gets there because it's like, I'm confused, I'm quitting, I have quit at line two. Okay, I quit at line two. So that code, it's as if it's not there. Now, sometimes that's fine with you. You just want to blow up and you want to see the message. You want to go look at line two and fix line two or maybe type the wrong stuff in. But, Sometimes you want to control for this. You want to say, you know what, I, I know what I want to do here, and I don't want to die, and I don't want to blow up. I want to continue. I want to put out an error message instead. And so 
So the key is, is when this code blows up, it's, it's something that you kind of take personally because you know you are that set of instructions. And when a traceback happens inside the memory or CPU, that's you that's being vaporized. You've been traceback. And so we take it kind of personal. I mean, if you were to use software that I built, like the autograder for this class, and you started getting tracebacks, I'm like, hey, that's kind of a personal thing. I, I didn't do my job well. I didn't catch all the errors. I didn't think of everything. You could type something that would cause my code to blow up. And so I, I take that kind of personally. And so we have to be able to compensate for situations that we know might cause errors, especially those where the user can type something that can cause my program to blow up. That's really like, I'm going to let you blow my program up. I am going to compensate. I'll, I'll tell you, sorry, that's bad data, but I don't want it ever you to ever see a traceback because it's kind of shameful to see a traceback for a professional program. Okay, so here's how it works. It's a, it's a bit of stuff with some indentation and colons. It, it looks like a lot, but don't worry, you'll, you'll figure it out. So the idea is, is you have a line of code that you know is dangerous. So this conversion of an integer, let's just say this came from an input statement. In this case, we'll just make it be hello, Bob. We know this is going to fail. And, and so this is the line in which we kind of want to take out insurance on. So instead of just putting this line in here, like we did in the previous example, we just had it right there. Instead of taking that line there, we say, you know what? We're going to take and stick this in a try and accept block. So we say the word try. Try ends in a colon, which means it's an indented block of code. And then we put the dangerous line in there. And then we put accept. And then the accept is kind of like an else and an if then else. But what it really is is code that Python will execute if something goes wrong. So this is either going to run and work and skip this, or if it goes bad, it's going to run, blow up, and then run this stuff and then continue on. But in no case will you get a traceback. Meaning if this line is going to generate a traceback, it actually just runs the accept clause. So it's kind of like an if things work out, do this. If things don't work out, do this other thing. So in this case, when this runs, this is going to fail because that's hello, Bob. And then it's going to come out here and set this to negative 1. So that's going to blow up. Set this to negative 1. And that's going to print it out. So it says first equals negative one. And so it, it, we didn't trace back. In the previous time we ran this, it traced back because we caught it. Now, the way the try accept works is if everything is fine, it has no effect. So if we, the next thing we're going to convert is 123, the digits 1, 2, 3 in a string. We do a try and we try to convert it and it works. And so we just keep on going. We don't run the accept. So this code does not run because this code succeeded. There was no traceback that was going to be generated. There's a traceback generated up here. There was no traceback generated here. So it comes through and the result is iStir ends up with a integer 123. And so it's 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 an insurance policy or it, it says I know this might blow up and if it does I'm giving you alternate text or alternate code to run. So the the thing about the try accept block and you might be tempted to do this, and that is put your entire, if you're getting tired of tracebacks and blowing up, you might want to put your entire program in a try and accept block. And you might say try blah, 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 and then accept something bad happened. The problem is, is if your program is blowing up, you actually want to know about it. And the way the try and accept block works is if it's in the middle of a try and accept block and something goes wrong, like in this particular line, it doesn't come back and finish the try and accept block. It actually exits to the accept and then comes out. And to draw this in a diagram, so here we go. We start this thing. We're in the try block. We're doing print. Print safe. Doesn't hurt anything. We do this. This blows up with a traceback. Traceback. And then that says go to the accept block, run whatever's in the accept block, and then continue on. What's not going to happen is it's not going to go back up and do this or back up and try this one again. No, 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 no. Once it gets the accept block, there is only one way out to the bottom. And so this line of code never executes. And so one, that's one of the things we try to do where we just, you don't put too much stuff in. You, you, would, you would put this print statement out here and this print statement out here, and you'd only put one line in the try accept block if possible. Sometimes you put uh, a few more lines in there, but you try to minimize. You know what line is dangerous. Print is not dangerous. Print, and these two prints are not really dangerous, don't put them in the block. Because any line in the block, as soon as it hits a bad line with a traceback, it's out of the block, runs the accept, and then continues on. So here is a more 
uh, practical example um, where we're going to read a number from the user and you know print out either nice work or not a number. And so we take an input statement which stops and waits for us to type and then we type 42 and then 42 goes into roster and then we know that this int is dangerous, right? And this roster came from the user, whatever the user typed. And so we put it in the try block and if it's 42, it converts and it says i val is greater than zero, we print it out. So it says nice work. Now, we'll run this code again. Okay, we run it a second time and now we enter something, it says 42, but it's like F-O-R-T-Y. And so 42 is what goes in here. We, as the programmer, had no control over what our crazy user was typing, right? You're starting to be a programmer and crazy users do crazy things to your poor programs, even if they're only like seven lines long. So we got 42 coming in here. We know this is gonna blow up. This int is gonna blow up with a trace back. But that's okay, we've compensated for that. And we told Python, hey, we know that might happen. And if you detect a traceback, jump straight into the accept block, run this, set it to negative one, and then continue on. So this is the de-indent of the try accept block. And if it's greater than zero, we say nice work, but in this case, it's not. And we say not a number, and so it comes out with not a number. What's, here, what's not here is a traceback. There is no traceback in this. That's what we achieved. And it doesn't hurt there's no, you know, when it works, you don't need, the try accept kind of does nothing because the accept code, when it works, is ignored. So it's like code you add in case something happens in an other line of code. Pretty cool, actually. So we have, you have a couple exercises and I've got uh, some videos of those exercises. So in summary, what we talked about in this chapter is comparison operators, uh, logical questions. The uh, key is, is that these comparison operators don't change their arguments. You can say if x is less than five, doesn't change the value for x. Um, we have indentation and how important indentation is. One-way decisions with if, two-way decisions with if then else. Nested decisions where you have an if inside of an if that moves on in, uh, else if, and then try and accept to catch errors that you wanna catch, okay? So thanks a lot.